Hello, is anyone there? Yes, we are here. Okay. All right. So today yes, is we must leave. Your line is getting up. I don't know. Maybe the net. Can you hear me? Okay. I'm gonna assume that you are hearing me. You will let me know if you're not hearing me. We can hear you. Thank you. Okay, so today we're going to continue and do assignment five, which covers chi squared and also regression. So we're going to use the template. So the first um uh, we're going to assume the, f the next 45 minutes, we're going to cover chi squared. So you need to have your templates ready, which is a chi squared template. It looks like this. It's written there, chi squared test example template. That's what we're going to use. Um, you will need your table. Your statistical tables are so ready. We're going to use the chi square critical values of chi. Um, go down the table. Yeah, the critical values of chi squared. This is the table we're going to use. And remember the summary that you have already went through as well, which covers most of the things you need to know about chi square test. And remember, with chi squared, you only need to do chi square for independence, right? So these are the notes that you're going to go and study. And you're going to use them as well if, when you are writing your exam. So let's recap on chi squared. In terms of chi square of independence, we only use independence. Independence. So there are also six steps or five steps. So step number one is to state your null hypothesis and your alternative. Your null hypothesis will always state that the two variables are independent. Independ independent. So in your null hypothesis statement, it will always state that your two categorical values of variables are independent and your alternative will state that they are dependent. So your statement should have only those two. Step number two is to calculate your expected. So with chi-square for independence, we also call it for contingency table. 
and the contingency table has the number of rows and the number of columns. So they would have given you the observed values. You will need to calculate your expected values for all your observed value. So then it means on your contingency table, if they didn't calculate your totals and your grand total, you need to calculate them before you do anything. And then you calculate your expected value by taking the raw total of that observed value. You multiply it with the column total of that observed value and you divide it by the grand total or what we call the sample size. And that will give you the expected value. That will be your expected values. In order for you to calculate your test statistic, you need to have already calculated this expected value. Step number three is to find the critical value. is to find the critical value. And to find the critical value, you're going to use your chi-square critical value of alpha and the degrees of freedom. Your critical value, you will, sorry, it's alpha over two, um, so bad. Even though it is a one-sided, but we find the critical value by using alpha over two, and the degrees of freedom. You're going to find your critical value there. Step number four, you're going to calculate your test statistic. And your test statistic will be given by cast squared stat, which is the sum of your observed minus your expected divide by the expected and you need to square the answer. Only the top part squared. It is the sum of your observed minus your expected squared divide by the expected. And that will give you, you will be calculating the test statistic. The last step, which is step number five, is to make a decision. Now, with a chi-square test, even though you go to the table, if you should know how chi-square test region of rejection looks like, even though we do use alpha over two, but with a chi-square test, you will also see that the distribution is a left skew distribution. And I think I'm using the degrees of freedom wrong. The degrees of the critical value we use alpha, alpha and the degrees of freedom, not alpha divided by two. That's my mistake there. Just alpha and the degrees of freedom. And what I didn't mention is the degrees of the degrees of freedom is your number of rows minus one times the number of columns minus one. That is the degrees of freedom. In order for us to do number five, which is our chi-square alpha and the degrees of freedom, means if anything falls in the shaded area, you're going to reject the null hypothesis because it's always a positively skewed data or it is a left um, 
one side as a uh, distribution. And you find that uh, the, reject the rejected value will be on the left, on the right hand side. Any value that falls greater than the critical value, you're going to reject that. And the critical value, remember, you're going to find it on the table. And your critical value, you're going to use the table to find your critical value. And also, remember, we also use the upper tail area, which means we're using only the values closer to the table and the degrees of freedom that you would have calculated. Those are the steps that you need to always remember about chi squared. Okay. So let's look at. The questions. Based on everything that I've just explained right now, you should be able to answer the questions that are following. Question one, which one of the following statement is incorrect about chi squared test? of independence between two variables. A, the alternative hypothesis is that the two variables are independent of each other. B, the expected frequency of each cell is equal to the row total times the column total divided by N, where N is the sample size. C, the test statistic has the number of rows minus one times the number of columns minus one degrees of freedom, where R is your number of rows and C is your number of columns. D. The two variables are categorical. E, if the observed and the expected frequency for each cell are equal, then the test statistic will be equal to zero. Which one of the following statement is incorrect? A, B, C, D, or E. The only thing that we didn't explain is E. What E says, if we need to calculate the te this test statistic, it says the answer will be zero. If your fre observed frequencies and your expected frequencies are equal. So let's assume that we have this contingency table that looks like this. It has a row. Uh, this is column, column one and column two, and row one and row two, right? And here we have one, 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 one. As our, let's make it even interesting. One, two, three, four. As our observed values, and then we take our observed values. We go and we calculate the expected values. And we have our uh, column one, column two, and row one, row two. Let's assume that we did everything the same way. We take the total and we divide by N, all those, the formula for calculating. We remember, we did the expected value calculation. Let's assume that I'm not going to calculate it. We're going to make assumptions. Let's assume that based on this information, they say they are equal. So it means the expected value for this observed value is one. This will be two, this will be three, and this will be four. So then the observed and the expected value are equal. So let's validate that. So we know that our chi squared that states that. We need to have the sum 
of your observed minus your expected squared divide by your expected, right? So let's see if my observed minus your expected will be equals to zero for this data that we have. This is our expected data. So we'll say one minus one squared divide by one plus two minus two squared divide by two plus three minus three squared divide by two by three because they are all equal plus four minus four squared divide by four. This will be zero because one minus one is zero. Any value that can divide into the, it will remain zero. So the answer here will be zero plus zero plus zero plus zero because four minus four is zero. Zero squared is zero. Zero divided by any number will remain zero. So the answer will be equals to zero. So let's see. We're looking for the incorrect one. So the first one it says if the observed and the expected frequency for each cell are equal, and we made them equal, then the test statistic will be equals to zero. You can see that that is correct because the statement that we just made, we made an example dummy data and we tested that and we found that it is equals to zero. You can even use other values like 20 and 20, 10, 30 and 30, 40 and 40, you will still get the same results. Remember, for contingency table, we said we use two categorical variables. So there are your two categorical variables. There will be two categorical variables when you do a chi-square test. The test statistic has the number of rows minus the number of rows minus one times the number of columns minus one degrees of freedom. What did we learn? We said the degrees of freedom has number of rows minus one times the number of columns minus one. And this says also where R means number of rows and C means number of columns. And it's the same thing as what we just explained because the degrees of freedom is calculated by using R minus one times C minus one means that statement is correct. The expected frequency for each cell is equals to, let's go back to our equation. We said to calculate the expected value or the expected frequency is your row total times your column total divided by the sample space or the sample size or the grand total, right? So let's go back this to the question. The expected frequency for each cell is equals to the row total times the column total divided by n, where n is the sample size, which is something that you would have learned with the six steps or the five steps of the hypothesis for chi squared or for contingency table or for independence. Number A. The alternative hypothesis is that two variables are independent. How do we state the null hypothesis and the, and the alternative hypothesis? The null hypothesis always has independent. The alternative will have dependent. So the question here, it says alternative. It has independent. It should not be independent. It should be dependent of each other which means the incorrect statement is that one. So, as you can see, I don't know if you are saying something because I am I have muted you all because I'm hearing myself. I quickly want to switch off and come back. Just give me a second.
Hello. Yes, I'm sorted. I can hear myself again. Ah, oh, what a relief. I apologize for that. I'm going to come back again. Let me know if you're not hearing me as well. I hope you, are, you can hear me. I can hear you. Okay. And the session is still recording, right? I can hear you, ma'am. Thank you. I just want to check the recording, if it's still recording. Okay, still recording. Okay, so let's continue with question two. In a contingency table with six rows and three columns, how many degrees of freedom do we have? I'll write the formula and you are going to do the calculations. So the degrees of freedom is the number of rows minus one times the number of columns minus one. How many rows do we have? Sure, nobody wants to talk to me. Six rows we have minus one. How many columns? We have three columns. Three columns. Minus one. And the answer is? 10. Six minus one is five times three minus one is two. And the answer is 10, which means B is our answer. Easy, right? Easy, easy, easy things. Now consider a contingency table with five rows and two columns. In a chi-square test of independence, if the level of significance is 1%, what is the critical value. So remember your critical value, it's critical values of chi, it's alpha and the degrees of freedom. So therefore, it means you need to go and calculate your degrees of freedom, which is number of rows minus one times number of columns minus one. So it will be five minus one times Two minus one. What is your degrees of freedom? It's four. It's four. The degrees four. of freedom is four. So now let's go and find chi square of zero comma zero one because one percent is one divided by hundred is zero comma zero one and four. So let's go to the table where it says the chi-square we're looking for four and zero comma zero one, not zero comma one, zero comma zero one, which means we go out And the answer is thirteen point two seven seven, which is option A. And that's how you find the critical value. So you need to know that for chi square, you go to the chi square critical values of chi and use the upper tail values, which are the values closer to the table. You want to use values closest to the table, especially the alpha values, and your degrees of freedom will be 
devemos alcançar. Oh, the grace of freedom will be on the left. So you need to make sure that you use the right table. You must check and double check because sometimes you might be in a hurry and not double check and end up using the critical values of T because you can see that it looks exactly almost the same as the chi-square. So pay attention to details when you answer the questions. Moving on to the next one. Unless if there is another a question. If there is none, consider the contingency table below to test the independence of distance from home to school and the school level. What is the expected frequency of primary school learners traveling more six kilometers from home to school? Choose the correct answer from the list below. Now, here is your chance to use the, you can either use the formula or you can use the template. What they are asking you to calculate is the expected frequency. Your expected frequency is the number, the row total times the column total and I put C, C total, divide by N. What is missing on this table are your totals. So it means you're going to calculate your total. You're going to also calculate your total. And you're going to have the grand total there. And then you're going to um, give the, or oh, calculate, substitute into the formula and calculate. So let's calculate manually. Uh, 115 plus 75. 190. 190, 210 plus, plus 313 and 313 plus 165 480 480 let's go to the row 115 plus 210 plus 315 this one i cannot do by heart now 640 640 and 75 plus 120 plus 165? 360. 360. 360. And 340. Oh, sorry, 640 plus 360. 1,700. 1,700. Huh? Sorry, where, where are you calling? Okay. 640 plus 360. Huh? Yes. One thousand. Oh, six forty, not three forty. Six forty. It's one thousand. It's one thousand. Okay. And also, if we add one ninety plus three thirty plus four eighty, we'll get one thousand. Okay. So now we can substitute into this formula. Remember, they're only interested in primary school learners traveling more than six kilometers more than six kilometers is greater than six kilometers and primary so we only interested in those ones so we're going to take the row total of the 315 the row total is 600 and 40. this is the row and these are the columns so we take the row total and we take the column total times the column total is 480 divided by 
grand total, which is a thousand. And do the math and give me the expected value. What is the answer? Three o seven comma two. Three o seven comma two. Three o seven comma two. That's what you get. Three o seven comma comma two, and you can round it off to a whole number because here yeah, we only have whole numbers. Therefore, it means it will be C. Alternatively. You can use your template. So let's do that using the template. I'm just gonna go to our template. First, we need to identify what is the type of contingency table that we have. We have two rows, three columns, right? It's a two by three contingency table, right? So since we are able to identify that it is a two, two by three, please remember not to count the total columns as well. Only the data columns counts. So we're going to go and look for a table that has two rows and three columns, and it is the second one. So we can change this to primary, and high school and this will be we need to use the the information we have here i just need those ones we can say this is less than three kilometers and this is between uh take it somewhere else Let's go and do. That's between, and the last one is greater than. I can just say greater than six kilometers. Right? And then now we can substitute all the values. Let's start with primary, and it's 115 and 175. And the next one has 210 and 120 the challenge with working online is all this because now i need to have a space in order for me to see the table so i can put the date 315 and 116 all the data is there so all I need is to go to the expected value. There is the expected value and I can just format it by using the format. And there's my answer of 307. And that's what we found. Easy, right? The answer is yes. 307. So you can use the templates to answer the question. They can save you time, but you need to practice because it's not as easy as the way I'm making it here, right? So that is if you use the template, you can either use the template or you can calculate manual. As you can see there, it was as quick as using the template. So let's move to question five. Now we have the following two by three contingency table contains, and this contingency table contains the observed frequency and the expected frequencies in the bracket. So they already calculated the expected frequencies. And they are telling us that this comes from a sample of 348. So it means if I add 75, 34, 60, 50, 88, 41, it should give me 348. The next thing, 
They're asking you to calculate the chi-square test. So it means you're going to calculate the test statistic, chi-square test statistic using the rows and columns. So it means you will have to use your observed minus your expected squared divide by the expected. It might take you forever in the exam. So we'll go back to our template. When we use the template, ignore the expected because on the template, it has already the expected values, right? So it is a two by three. So we're going to use, continue to use the same contingency table. So I just wanna make it smaller so I can get to the data. So now I'm, I need to change all this to reflect what I have. So I have P, I have Q, and I have A, I have B, and I have C. And I can just put the values 75, 60, and 88. Do the same, 34. And 50 and 41. And 348, 348. So it did have captured all the data. It calculated automatically my expected values. So I don't have to worry about the expected value. What I need is the test statistic. If I scroll down on this. You will see that there is a field for test statistic. So there it is. And it says our test statistic is 6.36, which is option A. Easy, ne? So like, like I said on Sunday, Please check what question you got on your assignment. Use the template, see if you get the answer because you will be following the same steps as what we did. If you are going to calculate manually, then I will suggest that you put the timer to how long you take to do the calculations, because you will need to say 75 minus 69.85 squared divided by 69.85 plus 60 minus 70.49 squared divided by 70.49 plus 88 minus 82.66 squared divided by 82.66 plus until you do everything up until you get to 41 minus 46.34 squared divided by 46.34 and you calculate the whole the whole thing it's not too many but it's time consuming especially if you can make one mistake in both cases whether you are using the template or you are calculating manual one mistake will give you the wrong answer so you need to be very careful when you are putting the values onto your template as well that you put in the right values. Okay, so question six should be almost the last one. Question Sorry, six. Lizzie. Yes. Well, I'm scared to ask the question, but where can I get the contingency table? Anyone who has an answer to the question? <laughs> it's in the link that you sent. 
Lian, are you not? Uh, were you not part of my e Twitter group? No. Are you part um, of the WhatsApp group? So I've gone to YouTube to see your videos and no, under playlists. Um, you are not answering my question. Are you part of my WhatsApp group, the STA Fab 2023 group? Yes, on WhatsApp, I am. Yes. This afternoon, I sent very harsh messages there and I laughed. Oh, no, I know, that's what I said I'm scared to laugh. <laughs> I, and I sent some screenshots. Uh, okay, let me have a look at that. Okay, don't worry. I'll have yes. a look at that. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, all the information I'm using, you all have access to it. And since from day one, I have never, ever even neglected to say this. And, and I've never withheld any information. I made sure that it is accessible. It's somewhere very public. Um, where everyone can have access to. Thank you. So you just need to pay attention to those communications as well. Sorry, Daisy, before you continue, I just want to find out, in the exam, will they allow us to use this template? Oh, gosh. Oh, my goodness me. So you guys, I don't know whether you are listening to me or you're not. Really? I just no, asking finished for, explain, but I just uh, finished explaining about the template, so it means you are allowed to use it, right? I wouldn't oh, okay. No, use the RS app. So I'm thinking if we're going to use multiple screens, isn't that gonna flag us? No, because also the people who passed this module like in November, they also use the templates, right? They also had the template. So when I say in the exam, check your time, whether you want to calculate manually or you want to use the template, I am giving you options that you can choose. It's up to you. You need to choose. The only thing that the iris system will do is to flag if there is um some sort of actions that are happening on your computer, whether there are people or you look like you are talking or something like that. You must remember this is still an exam and it's written under the exam conditions. No one should be able to help you write the exam, but your exam is an open book because it's an online exam. You are required to bring the tables, and the tables are on your computers, most likely. So you will be moving around in terms of going to the tables, looking for the values and coming back onto your screen. Iris will not flag you if there is no inconsistent. The flagging is around how you behave during when you are writing in terms of standing up, moving, talking, raising hands and doing action that tells you that there is somebody else in your in the room with you. That's how it gets flagged. But now I am distracted from, from this, and now I'm explaining the administrative issues, which we address at the later stage. Okay, so let's go back to content. Anything I share with you, you can use. Hence, sometimes I'm even scared to tell you what you need to take, because then I'm teaching you how to cheat in the exam, which is not what I want to do, right? So some of these things, take them as with a pinch of salt, as sometimes I don't want to stress it because the YouTube videos become pr uh, public. Everybody can listen to, everybody can share them, and they might reach the wrong people. And I'm explaining all these other things here. That hence I prefer not to explain administrative issues and hacks and tricks on the YouTube video, but outside of the YouTube video. So please let's pay attention 
and then yes right let's move on next we go to question five i am so sorry about that question six the test statistics for the test of independence from question five has been calculated but now this is not from question five it should be question four that is the previous question that we calculated right question four we were using the same information has been calculated and we found that it is 1.56 that is the test statistics that is our chi square state they calculated that and they found that it is 1 comma 5 6 there is no need for you to go and do anything else extra on this because looking at the options the first thing you do when you open your questions or you go to your question look at the options options usually guide you and help you save time in the exam so look at the option the options are you need to make a decision they have calculated your chi-square test therefore they are asking you based on this chi-square where does it fall if the region of rejection is somewhere but you don't have that. Let's go and calculate this region of rejection, the critical value. How do we calculate the critical value? The critical value is alpha and the degrees of freedom. How many number of rows do we have? So our degrees of freedom is number of rows minus one times number of columns minus one. How many number of rows we have? Oh, because I was so harsh on you guys, you decided to keep quiet. Maybe you even left yeah, them. <laughs> the number of rows? Two. two. There are two. Minus one times the number of columns? Three. Three minus one three minus one and your degrees of freedom is that's two hmm? two Which minus two? one is one three minus two is two one times two is is two sure. and they say at ten percent level of significance so therefore our Critical value, we're going to find it at 0, 0,10 and 2. So we need to go to the table. Let's go to the table. The next step is to go to the table and look for 2 degrees of freedom. And our alpha is 0, 0,10 because it's 10%. So they both meet. That is your critical value, 4,605. So we go back there and we say this is 4,605. So Let's look at our test statistic. Where does our test statistics fall? Is it in the white or in the red? In the red. Our test statistics is 1,56. Is it in the red shaded area or the white area? It in is the in the in the white red area. Red. It is in the do not reject H naught. Now we need to make a decision. What do we know? If we are not rejecting, if we are not rejecting the null hypothesis, how would we have said the null hypothesis is school level? And distance from school, we would have said school level 
and distance from school are independent. And then in the alternative, we would have said they are dependent. Now, if we are not rejecting the null hypothesis, how do we conclude? So we're going to go to the conclusion and we're going to eliminate any way away it says we reject because we are not rejecting. We do not reject. So let's see which statement between A, B, and E. So let's start with E because A and B, they look almost the same. E says the alternative hypothesis is that the distance from school to home and school level are independent. That is alternative. Is it correct or incorrect? Correct. Incorrect. Mm -hmm. Alternative. Incorrect. It is incorrect. So we also going to ignore that one. So C, D, and E are incorrect. We are looking for the correct statement. So let's go to A. A says we do not reject the null hypothesis and conclude that the distance from home to school and school level are independent of each other. And B says we do not reject the null hypothesis and conclude that the distance from home to school and school level are not independent of each other. Which one, A or B? This time I'm not, I'm not telling you the answer. A or B, based on, if we are not rejecting the null hypothesis, how do we conclude? It's A, Lizzie. It will be A, because the null hypothesis sales says distance from school and school level are independent of each other. So A will be the correct answer. As, as long as you can remember that your null hypothesis always state independent and your alternative stay dependent, there is nothing that can go wrong. Always remember that. H not independent. H A or H one dependent. Okay, moving on. Now we go into the regression and I think 45 minutes could have been that. Let's see. Yes, almost. Okay, I will take the five minutes for the venting part. So the next uh, minutes, almost 45 minutes or so left, we're gonna do regression. So in terms of regression as well, we're going to use the, tem the templates. And this is the template that we're going to be using. So it is the regression model example template. You will find it in the same folder where it has templates. That's where you will find the same. So it looks like this. It's a big Excel sheet that we're going to be using. So what else do we need to know about um, regression? Couple of things. In terms of regression, there is the regression line, which is given by the regression line given by y hat is equals to b b0 plus b1x, where your b0 is your intercept and b1 is your slope and X is your variable of interest, where your Y estimate is your estimate. If your X is zero, your estimate will be the same as your Y intercept. 
Now, your slope is the change, is, is the change in units. It is when you add one additional unit increase in this variable, it might increase or decrease your y variable. So if I add one additional increase of your x value, it might increase or decrease based on the sign, the plus increase, the negative decrease, the value of your y estimate. Those two we can interpret. One additional unit, increase or decrease if it's negative if the slope sign is negative we say it is a decrease because it will decrease the value of your y estimate if it's positive we say it will be a, an increase that is explaining the slope which is b1 b0 it is your y estimate if the value of x is equal to zero, therefore it means if x here is zero, b1 is zero, therefore your y estimate will be equal to the intercept. The other thing you need to remember about the regression is the coefficient of correlation. Your coefficient of correlation, which is r, that r is between, r lies between negative one and one when one or negative one are strongly or perfectly correlated zero no correlation 0 0.5 uh, it's moderately correlated 0 0.35 weak correlation whether it's positive or negative so you will add the side which is the direction based on the side if it's negative you say it is negatively correlated if it's positive you say it's positively correlated if it's 90 percent or 90 negative or positive you say it's strong correlation if it's 0 0.35, 0 0.15, you say it's weak, or 0 0.35 or 0 0.4, you will say it is moderate, things like that. So you need to know how to interpret your coefficient of correlation. Also, every information that I'm just sharing with you is part of those summary notes. If you use them well, there's nothing that can go wrong. Then you have the coefficient of determination. The coefficient of determination tells you what are the variability in your independent that your, yes, the variability in your independent that is influenced by the variability in your dependent variable or your independent variable. The variability in your independent variable oh sorry in your dependent variable how much of it is influenced by the variability from your independent variable so you need to know how to explain that as well now your coefficient of determination which is also r squared it lies between two values zero and one also it's always positive because you will say 95 percent of the variability in y is attributed by the variability in x things like that okay so that's how you will interpret your coefficient of determination what else you need to know about these two things? That's all for now. Otherwise, go and read more about the properties of regression. Remember also the scatter plot. You can also get the scatter plot will tell you whether if the data values look like this, are they positively 
and if the, it looks like the graph looks like this where your y and your x it tells you when the value of your x increases the value of your y increases so it will be positive if it will look like this it says when your values of x increases your values of y decreases if it looks like this it's constant when the values of x increases the values of y stays constant then the correlation there will be equals to zero this correlation can be perfect or it can be 90 percent or 98 the same as that this one will be a minus 98 percent and this one can be a positive 98 percent depending on how you calculated your correlation and this can be 0%, which means there is no variability here. Okay. So you need to know how and how to identify and how to plot your scatter plot. Remember, for every point of X, it corresponds with the point of Y. Those are the things. So now let's answer the questions. Question seven. Which one of the following statement is incorrect about some of the concepts of simple linear regression, which is everything that I just explained right now. So let's see. The least square method, which is that formula that we just use, is called the least square method estimate. The regression equation by maximizing the error sum of square. Uh, mm. No, by no. Because we're looking for the incorrect statement. Okay, that is the incorrect one. It doesn't do that because we, yeah, even though there are some residual, we call them residuals. Uh, the sum square. No, we don't estimate maximizing the errors. We cannot. We we try to minimize the errors because we want to make sure that there are a little bit of those errors that are coming up or creeping up from your least square. Because as much as we want to estimate the new values, we need to make sure that the estimates are as close as possible to the original values. So the bigger the errors, it means your estimations are bigger as well. So that it's a no-no, okay? So that you wouldn't know um, I'm not sure how you will find it uh, in your textbooks or in your study guide if they do explain such concepts. I, I know that in my tutorial classes, I've never touched on concepts like this, but I think, I guess, uh, by looking at these questions, we're trying also to answer some of those gaps that we have. Okay, so... I'm gonna answer this whole question by myself and then the next we can do together. Number B, the coefficient of determination gives an indication of how well the estimated regression equation fits the data. Yes, because we know that um, your, uh, your values of your independent values, they attribute how much of it attrib uh, attributed to how you estimated the values of your y. So that will be correct. Oh, this is the incorrect one. The coefficient of determination always takes the values between zero and one. I just explained it there and that is correct. The correlation coefficient always takes the values between minus one and one. I explained it there. And that is correct. The correlation coefficient takes on the sign of the slope. Oh, that's the other thing that I didn't mention. So the slope and the coefficient of correlation would always have the same sign. So you cannot have a correlation of positive and have a slope of negative. They always have the same sign. So, oh. That is correct. So you need to you need to go and learn 
about the regression. So let's go to the summary notes, like I said, because this is the last chapter section that we're going to do. So you're going to learn about the scatter plots. Um, and then you, here are the explanation in terms of how you interpret the coefficient of correlation. Um, what does it mean when R is smaller, when R is bigger than zero, when it's zero? And in terms of the, the strength and the direction, how do you interpret it? If you are given a scatter plot, how does your scatter plot look like? But all these are also part of the PowerPoint slides that we went through on a weekly basis last year during our e Twitter session and so on. So there are they. It's just this is compacted into a small document. Uh, you just need to learn how to go. Oh, this is for ease of reference in terms of this. The, the equation for the sum square measures, um, as well as uh, how you calculate your coefficient of determination by using the sum square measures, how you interpret, like you can see there, 100% of the variation in Y is explained by the variation in X. So if it was 98% of the variation, it will say 98% of the variation in your dependent variable is explained by the variation in your independent variable and so on how you interpret that and then how you calculate the regression line which is your least square method formula that we use which is your y estimate and your intercept your slope and the X observation um, and how you do the calculations to calculate the slope, the mean, the median, the mean and the intercept and the regression line. So there are some formulas, but we will use the template for doing that. How we calculate the regression line using the summation formula, or you can use your calculators. Oh, that's the other thing. You can also use your calculator to calculate the regression line to calculate the slope, to calculate the uh, the coefficient of correlation, the coefficient of determination. But this is one of the documents that also summarizes everything that we did. You will see that most of these notes are the same as those in the PowerPoint slide. Okay, so let's look at more questions, unless if there is a question. Okay. If there are no questions. Now, when we look at questions like this, where they give you the scatter plot and they say, consider the sample data below and develop a scatter plot. Which one of this, which one of the scatter plot A to F best describe the data? Use the process of elimination. You don't have the whole day in the exam to go through all the points. Choose any of the points, let's assume we go into check to check which value of X is the minimum and which one is the maximum. And then we do the same with Y, minimum and maximum. And we come to the graph and we eliminate. If the graph does not have the minimum and the maximum value, that graph we can eliminate from this so that then we are left with the graphs that we're going to use to test our data instead of us going through all this information. So let's look at X minimum. X, the minimum value here is 15, is 14, right? The smallest value here is 14. So if X value starts at 14, so any graph that does not have 14 on the X axis, we're going to eliminate. That starts at 20, that starts at 15, this starts at 15, this starts at 10, that starts at 10. So it means D, B, and A are out. We are left with three. Process of elimination. Let's look at the... We can also go with the maximum value. The maximum value here is 41 for X. So that goes to 60, that goes to 40, that goes to 41. 
Ya 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 phone. Yeah, yeah, switch out of phone. Let eh bar ke mic wa how. My apologies my sister. Thank you. Eh uh, so we already eliminated four without even looking at the data in detail. So we only have two graphs that we can say we will use to find out which one is the correct one. So let's do that. So looking at our X values as well, that's very important. So if the data ends at 41, which is our highest, right? And the graph has a point above 41 because 41 is here. If our X value is more than 41, then it means we're going to eliminate. There is this point, which is bigger than 41. There is no other data point that is bigger than 41. C is also eliminated. I'm only left with E, therefore E is my answer. The right graph is E. And then you look at the options. Pay attention to the option because the option, might, they might have also scrambled them. But in your mind, know that E is the only graph that matches the data. We can also validate that. It says when X is 41, Y is 10. 41, and we expect that point to correspond to 10. We can choose another value. Let's choose 28 out of the blue, which is the last value. It says when X is 28, we go and look and assume somewhere between there and there is 28. We can assume that one of those two points is 28. Uh, and it says Y is 22. Y is 22. Then I'm gonna assume that this is 28 and 22. So there is no need for me to go and check the other values because of a process of elimination. You do that, you will save a whole lot of time in the exam. That is question number eight. There's nothing more I can explain about how you find out which one I just showed you. I uh, showed you how to find which one is correct. So you can also use the points. So you can go and say, I'm gonna use the process of elimination. Can I find X of 14? and y of 17 on each one. So you can see that x there does not have 14, x there does not have 14, x there does not have a 14. And if I'm on here and I'm assuming that is a 14, then that is correct. But it says it's 17, so it needs to be somewhere here. There should be some 14 and 17 value somewhere there. You can see that also doesn't work. So you use the logic like that to do the process of elimination. There are many ways to skin a cat. Find the one that you feel comfortable using, the shortcut that you can use to find out which one is correct or incorrect. Are there any questions? If there are no questions, then we move on to question number nine. You are tasked with investigating the relationship between reading speed and age of primary and high school learners using simple linear regression. Which one of the following statement about the investigation is incorrect? <clears throat> and here we're talking about the regression. So, Based on the information that we spoke about earlier in the beginning when we started, there are certain things that I didn't mention straight through and all that, right? We didn't mention most of these things. <clears throat> so we need to answer and find out which one of these questions are incorrect. I just want to point out also on the uh, on that summary document that we have, there are some notes that explains the regression, right? What the regression is. So what an independent variable is and what is an a dependent variable, right? So you just need to also make sure that you know the logic and understanding of that. So 
Remember, if I have this, I have my X and I have my Y, my independent variable influences what my dependent variable will be. So this will become my dependent variable and this is your independent variable. I'm already giving you the answers here. So it means you are going to be able to answer this with ease. Remember also, we're dealing with numerical values as well. So reading speed, age, think about it. What the, What is age? Is age discrete or continuous? Ask yourself that. Reading speed, can you count the reading or can you measure the reading? think about it because there's a difference between counting and measuring right counting is discrete measuring is continuous so think about it if the correlation coefficient is positive okay these are the things that we explained in the beginning i'm not gonna repeat that the slope is also one of those things that I explained in the beginning because then this tells you how you interpret the regression line. Okay, so let's see which one of the following statement is incorrect. That's your question, not mine. I'm asking you after I did all the explanation. A, the independent variable is reading speed. Look at the graph. Tell me if it's correct. B, age is a quantitative continuous variable. Can we count age or do we measure age? We did this with study unit one. We discussed this. If the correlation coefficient is positive, then there is a positive linear relationship between reading speed and age. Is that correct? Is it how we interpret coefficient of correlation? The estimated regression equation will take the form reading speed, which is your dependent variable, is equals to your intercept B0, plus your slope times your age, which is your independent variable, where your B0 is your independent, is your intercept and your B1 is your slope for the estimated regression equation. Which one is incorrect? A, B, C, or D? B. Huh? Nope. A. Yep. A is the incorrect one. I gave you the answers. They tell you that reading speed is Y. I told you that Y is your dependent variable. Age is X and I told you that X is independent variable. So independent variable should be age because the reading speed is your dependent variable. Age is continuous because we measure age in terms of years, months, days, hours, seconds. The minute you are born, the clock ticks and they tell you that you are born at 12.03. We measure that, we measure it. When somebody dies, we measure it in terms of the time. They died at 12.03. If it's at night, they will say they died the following day or they died on Sunday, if they died in, at midnight, right? Because we measure it in terms of time. Okay, moving on to questions. Hey. Consider the data below showing the age in years and reading speed in words per minute, WPM, of learners at the Khatong Primary School in Bujanala. Which one of the following calculated quantities is incorrect? 
Okay. So with this one, I will say use the template because the first one is easy to calculate. You can just take the age values, add them together. They will give you the sum of X. The second one, you need to calculate the mean and take every observation of your age value, subtract it from the mean, square the answer, add them together, and it will give you that value. Number C, and now it becomes even more complex. You need to calculate your X mean, which is the mean of age, and the mean of the reading speed, which is your Y. Then you take the observation of your age minus the mean of age multiplied by the observation of the reading speed minus the reading mean and add them all together and you will get the answer. B0, you will need to go and calculate B0. So let's use the template to calculate all this. So we go to our regression template. Even your calculator here won't help. Even if you can try to use your calculator. Now, let's look at our template. Our template is easy. It, it comes with instructions. There is some instruction on the template here on the yellow. It says to add a row by clicking in the cell in column B and row A and drag it to highlight the number of rows until Y2. Right click in set cell down you can repeat the step until you have enough rows to complete the X values and the table and blah, 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 blah. You will read, I will show you how to use it. I'm not gonna read the whole paragraph. So all these are related from X up until Y squared. But when you add the row, don't start here, start by B column. You go into, if you are deleting or you are adding, you have to start by B column and highlight up until you get to the Y and highlight, highlight. If you are adding few rows, you just highlight how many number of rows you are adding and you click on insert and you say down and it will insert three more rows. But there are a couple of things that you will need to do. You will have to go to column E up until column K and drag down so that then the calculation can follow. Right. Those are the steps. If you want to delete the rows, you go to column B. You follow the same step, the same way as how you add the new row. You go to column B. You drag to the number of rows that you want to delete and you delete until and then it going to say delete up because we're moving them upwards and there will be the number of rows that are remaining. Okay, so that's how you will add or delete rows. So now I need to add one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I have 10 rows I need. One, two, three, four, five, six. I have six, so I need four. I'm going to go here on the second one. One, two, three, four, because I only need four rows, and I need to make sure that I keep four rows highlighted. One, two, three, four. I click, insert, down, and there are my photos. I'm just going to delete only X and Y 
columns in this instance, only those ones except the row total. I'm not deleting that. And everything disappears. And I'm gonna add the values. I'm gonna add first the Y values and then I'll go to the Y values. So 10, enter. Nine, enter. Eight, enter. Five, enter. Seven, enter. Eighteen, enter. Five, enter. Five, enter. Eleven, enter. And thirteen, enter. So I should have added all of them. I don't have to easy check. Going up, I must enter them the same way and not mix match. So 150 goes with, with 10. So 150 enter, 130 enter, 120 enter, 55 enter, 105 enter, 216 enter. The challenge is I cannot see the values I'm entering because I am and I want to keep 71 enter 71 enter and go to the side. I've got 66, 66 enter 172 enter and 202 enter. Okay. Let me double check that I've entered all the values correctly. Uh -uh. Okay. So 10 goes with 150, 9 goes with 130, 8 goes with 120, 5 goes with 65, 7 goes with 105, 13 goes with 216, 5 goes with 7, uh, 71, 5 goes with 66, 11 goes with what, 72, and 13 goes with 202. So I've entered the right data. I can just ignore that. Go to my column E, highlight that, highlight that until Y2, and direct the values. Now I've got all the things I need. Just want to move this to the side. Okay. The values I'm interested in is the total because all this summation, summation, summation means total. Total means summation, adding up all of the values. So the sum of all X values is 86. And there is my 86. The sum of y is that, that is not what we're looking for. What we are looking for is the sum of xi minus the mean. So it means somewhere I'm calculating the mean and I'm not calculating the mean here. So probably somewhere I'm calculating the mean. We'll get to it. So let's The mean is calculated on column M. Where is the mean? So somewhere I'm calculating the mean. There is the mean. Our X bar, I am calculating it there. So if I want to clear that, I press escape, then it goes out. Okay, let's go there to the side. So the mean is there for x bar, it's calculated here, which takes the x value divided by how many they are, because I have the how many they are at the bottom They Automatically, it calculates them because it just counts how many columns I have, how many rows, sorry, how many rows I have. Okay, so let's answer the questions now, because now I've made sure that my templates have all the values. If you look at the top, it says the square of your X observation minus the mean of X. That is the same as what I am saying here. 
the square of your x observation minus the mean of x, the total will be the summation of your x minus the mean x squared, right? That is what it does. So the answer is 8840. So the answer is there. C says the sum of your x observation minus the mean times your y minus the mean of y. So here I'm calculating x minus the mean, which is this part, and y minus the mean of y, which is that part. So I'm doing it in two parts, and here I am combining the two. I'm multiplying the two brackets together. And the summation of that, which is the orange part, is the answer that I'm looking for. And let me look at my, I've got 31 percent, 83 left. But we're almost done, don't worry. Just give me some few more minutes and then we are done. We'll end up here and then the rest we can deal with them on Sunday. There will be only two or three questions left. I think it ends in question taking. Okay, so that is the sum of that. It's that. So that is correct, that is correct, that is correct. The slope is minus 2.80. So if you scroll to your right, you will find first your intercept. Okay, so the other thing, I must just make it smaller. So you will see there the slope, so this is the intercept. The slope, which is B1, you can see there, I'm also explaining, I'm giving you the formula. The slope, and I'm giving you the formula of how I calculated it as well. So the slope is, the slope is 8.75, which is E, and here it says it's 17.489. And B0, which is the intercept, is this. It's 20, minus 20.871. You can see there. It's the same. It's the same. So that D is correct. B1. Is the one that is not correct because it says B1 is 8.75, whereas it should be 17.498. So the incorrect answer is E. That's how you use the template. Otherwise, you can go and calculate manually. The formulas are there. All the formulas are also on the template. If you want to go calculate manually, there they are, the formulas to calculate B1, B0. Otherwise, the formulas are also on the template here yeah, to calculate the B zeros and the B ones, or if you want to continue and use the summations, you can use the summations. Um, I see on this, it cut off some of the calculations. So you can also use the nodes to see how we calculate them manually as well. They are on the nodes anyway. Okay, so that concludes today's session. Uh, the next questions, you can do them on your own and we can discuss them on WhatsApp or we will, I will see you on Sunday when we look at the past exam paper. Um, I still need to find the exam paper, but otherwise, uh, these are the questions. Or maybe let's do this question because it's very important that I explain this as well so with your 
regression line, you can estimate the value by substituting the value of x, right? So in terms of this question, the reading speed of um, learners at, I don't know how to pronounce that, Baja primary is estimated by the following regression line. Y is equals to 11.3 times X, which is your slope of 11.3 plus 15.9 with X as the age of the learners. Calculate the estimated reading speed of an 11 year old. So therefore my X here will be 11 years and choose the correct answer. So it says where I see my x, 1.3x plus 15.9, I must just substitute 11 and calculate what is the estimated reading speed of an 11 year old. What's the actor? You know, we can even finish all this. Eleven point three times eleven. Hundred and forty point two. Fifteen point nine. It's hundred and forty point two. We can take it to a whole number. It will just be hundred and forty. And we estimate it to 140 weight per minute. That is question 11. We can go to question 12. The reading speed estimated regression equation of learners at Mount View Secondary School is given by this equation. The reading speed is equals to 20.2 times the age minus 60.5 with the cor correlation coefficient of 0 0.97. So it means our R of 0 0.97. Which one of the following statement is correct? Number A, they are asking you to calculate R squared and interpret. So if I have my R, you just say 0 0.97 squared. You just press the X squared button on your calculator to calculate the value. What is R squared? It's 0, 0,994, which 941. If I leave it to one decimal and multiply that by 100, it will give you 94.1 percent so 91.4 uh, 94.1 percent of the total variation in the reading speed we know that the reading speed is y can be explained by age which the variation in age which is x therefore this is correct that is r squared that's how you interpret r squared number b that we need to interpret the slope where is the slope? That is the slope. What is the sign in front of the slope? It's positive. How do we interpret? One unit increase. If it's positive, increase. If it's negative, decrease. So one year increase in the learner's age, because if we increase the learner's age, it will increase because the sign in front of the slope is positive. It will increase the reading age by 60.59. Because if here yeah, I put one, this reading age will increase by 60.1, even though it is decreasing, but this is the intercept, it's not the, it's not the, um, 
it's not gonna increase the reading speed if it's negative. The slope, the intercept. But your slope is positive, so therefore it increases. Okay, that's another thing. Um, let's come back to that one. An eight-year-old learner is expected to have a reading of three or three, unless my sign here is wrong, it should be positive. So let's put the 18-year-old. So we just substitute where we see age, we put 18 and calculate this. That will be 18 times. 20.2 times 18 minus 60.5, it's 303, which means this is correct. And D says we have, because this is positive, we have a strong positive linear relationship between the age. That is correct. And hence I am still not convinced, but because of the slope or not the slope, the intercept is decreasing, not actually the slope. The slope is positive, so it's increasing, but the, the intercept is decreased, decreasing. So even though the intercept is, the slope is increasing based on the uh, the sorry even though the slope is increasing because the intercept is decreasing it will decrease it will not increase but it will decrease your uh, reading speed by 60.5 because of the sign in front of your your intercept so based on this that will be the incorrect one. It should be, it will decrease the reading speed by 60 because it's a minus. So that is the incorrect, the incorrect one. So let's look at the last, last, last one. And then we are done. Oh, why did I choose this one now? Okay, we will do this one on Sunday because then it forces us to use the template but you can go and try. No, it doesn't force you to use the template per se because they've given you the predicted value and the original values. So what you do uh, is on the template, it's easy as well. On the template, let's go to the template. This is fairly easy. On the template, if you scroll down, 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 down on the template, they, oh, you must go to the left as well. There is this section. So now on your template, we are going to use our X and Y as the two values. So this will be our X and this will be our Y. That's what you substitute onto your template, even though it's your already your estimated value. But now, this is what you do on your template. Because we're calculating SSR, and remember SSR is calculated by using the Y estimate and the mean. So if you put your Y estimate here, You take your predicted values and substitute them onto here and you put your, sorry, this is not your X, this is your Y, sorry, my bad. This is your Y and this is your Y estimate. This is what you do. The only two values that you need to substitute are those two values the y values and the y estimate they will calculate this value that's the value that you are looking for so 278 equals 343 equals 277 equals 285 
equal 311 equal 250 equal 299 equal 329 equal 296 equal and 291 equal. And you go to your estimate and you put 284.5. Four seven equal three four six and seven nine equal two seven and zero eight equal and two eight four point four seven equal. Two eight four point four seven equal two eight four point four seven equal how many there? Uh, one, two, three. So we now on two ninety four. Two nine four point eight five equal and 315.63 equal something wrong. 315.63 equal and 305.24 equal and 284.47 equal. The only thing that we need is SSR, which is this column. I just need to make it bigger. And the SSR is Two, three, what did I do? What am I doing that is so wrong here? Oh, I didn't calculate the mean. Where am I getting the mean? I'm getting the mean from somewhere, which is not the mean that I'm looking for. I'm taking the wrong mean, so I need to change that. We need to change M30. Uh, M13, uh, which is something that I didn't take into consideration. So that will be this divide by there are 10. Uh, we can do that. Then I just need to change this to that. And I'm just going to change that with a dollar sign. And because I need to log the cell so that it doesn't change for all the values. So drag, drag, drag. Direct, direct, direct. Uh, there might be something wrong that I'm doing. Are they 10? 10. <sighs> Lizzie, line 33E is incorrect. 27.08 should be 274.08. It should be 274. Yes. Yeah. Point zero eight. Thank you. Yeah. Pleasure. Yeah. And then the one just above is 346, uh, not 246. Oh, yeah. Three. Thank you for picking that up. Okay. And the answer is 4197. Maybe there's still some way where I wrote something wrong. You will have to double check my numbers as well. 
and 284.47, okay? And this side, 278, 343, 277, 285, 311, 250, 299, 329, 296, and 291. I still get, still get that. Four one nine six one or nine six point four point seven four, which if I round it off to it's none of those ones, but it's close to one of them, which is D. It's similar to D. D D D D D. Sorry, my lad. It's similar to D. I'm just curious about that then now. Okay, and that concludes today's session. And we have done all the revisions. Where am I at the right now? On this side. I see there is a hand. We do mail. Hi, Lizzie. Yes. Sorry again. Um, in your um website thingy under the revision section for assignment five, you 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 literally you put in the the one that we usually wrote on Unisa with the answers. And yes. So, um, I will explain that just now. Wait. Uh, I will explain that. I want to ask if you can share this one that doesn't have answers so we can practice without answers. Uh, when I'm saying I'm going to uh, discuss that because that is somebody else's who was helping me get the questions for you guys. I oh, didn't okay. check that before. I shared okay. that with everyone because her name is on there as well, right? And it might get her into trouble. Remember, no assignment. Oh, I also don't want to discuss it right here now on the recording. Are there any questions relating to the content? Let's get that one out. Any questions? Are we good that I can stop the recording so we can have our family meeting? And then we can talk about that.